But last night, Manchester United beat Sheffield United by two goals to one, but that doesn't tell the full story. So let's take a look at it in a bit more depth. But despite the second half heroics from Diogo Dallo, I really don't think Manchester United were very good in this game. And I'd imagine this title for this video is going to be somewhere along the lines of did Ten Hag get a little bit lucky or something like that? Because it was not a very good performance. And of course, the players are a big part of that. I think several players struggled. I don't think Victor Lindelof was very good despite playing a part in both goals. I think Dallo struggled. I thought Johnny Evans was poor. Bruno Fernandes was poor. Scott McTominay was poor. Overall, it was a poor performance. And actually, today I don't want to blame the players for that. Today I want to blame Eric Ten Hag because tactically... It didn't make too much sense to me. So we've got United in the dark black shirts here. Of course, it's more of that dark green kit. But if I bring a green kit onto here, it's not going to be too pleasant on the eyes. So we've got United in a 4-2-3-1 here. And the thing which frustrated me about this game was that Eric Ten Hag tactically set the team up wrong. And recently, we've been able to explain that because we can say, well, there's a lot of injuries in the squad, so he's limited to what he can do. So we can't blame him too much. In this game... I thought most of the solutions were actually already on the pitch, just being used wrong. And there was also one on the bench, Mason Mount, who didn't get used. So let's talk about why tactically I didn't understand it. And the first big thing is Victor Lindelof and Diogo Dallo being this way round. Doesn't make sense to me. Because what United are going to do in possession is they're going to move like this. So Bruno Fernandes is going to push further forward, as you'd expect. Of course, this rotates a lot. But in general, it's something like this. Victor Lindelof is going to come inside from left back to Jane, uh, to drag McAtee away from Marcus Rashford. So this is a, the sort of idea which United are going for in possession in terms of a build-up shape. Initially, that just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand why you would have Diogo Dallo deep as part of a back three and Victor Lindelof inverting into midfield where he doesn't have quick feet, he's not very progressive, he doesn't offer much here. So when he's getting the ball in this position, he's, he can't do anything from there. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think tactically it's actually really poor from Eric Ten Hag because what we saw eventually was actually rotations where Lindelof's all the way up here and that doesn't make sense. He's no good there. It, it's poor. Now you can say again, well, they've got injuries, but if we just swap Lindelof and Dallow, it makes a much, much more sense. Lindelof being a centre-back, playing as part of a back three, Diogo Dallow from left-back being right-footed, inverting into midfield, which is probably, as I've said before, my favourite version of him, inverting from left-back, it makes a lot more sense. And also when it comes to pushing forward and joining the attack, Diogo Dallo is much more suited to that. I also then think the centre-backs are playing the wrong way around. I'd rather see Harry Maguire left centre-back, Johnny Evans right centre-back, because then you've got Lindelof and Maguire either side of Evans. We know that Maguire can be very good and progress the ball from here. So tactically, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think Eric Ten Hag got the setup wrong. And yeah, that's one of the main problems in possession. The other problem was that United were confusing with the rotations so again there's situations a lot of this game Lindelof was dropping into this position as well and Johnny Evans would step forward into midfield that's not an optimal rotation Johnny Evans stepping into midfield of course we see John Stones do it for City and it looks very good Johnny Evans isn't John Stones this doesn't make sense we also saw spells of the game where there was a good 20 seconds where Johnny Evans had the ball deep and Harry Maguire was in like a right channel striker position for a good 20-25 second spell, standing there waiting for the ball. I, I don't understand that rotation. Tactically, it looked very confused for United. There seems to be a bit of an identity crisis almost. The team don't seem to know what they're meant to be doing a lot of the time. The other problem was that this midfield just did not start the game at all well. For the first 45-60 minutes, it was, it was awful really. Bruno Fernandes, say when Lindelof rotates wider, Bruno Fernandes drops in and his passing was really bad. Uh, have I got the number here somewhere? 23 out of 33 passes in the first half, which isn't good enough for a deep midfielder. I also thought Sofian Amrabat struggled to get into the game in the first half and didn't look great. And then Scott McTominay, over the full hour he was on the pitch, again, I've got the uh, stat here, he had eight passes in 63 minutes. Now, I like the idea of him playing as a shadow striker. I think it's his best role. This second striker position where he attacks the box. But you can only really afford that luxury when you're a good possession side. Because if you're not a good possession side, you're almost sacrificing a player in possession. Because he's pushing really far forward and we're leaving Bruno Fernandes and Amrabat to control it. We've got Bruno Fernandes playing awfully. Really, really bad performance. 
Amrabat not having his best day either, the fullbacks playing the wrong side and also the centre-backs playing the wrong side, you can see why it was such a bad start. Now, uh, Sheffield United this season averaged 38% possession in their matches. By the time the first goal went in, which was a goal for United to be fair, they had 58% possession. For the first half hour, this ball was camped in the Manchester United half and genuinely as a United fan, I don't know the last time I saw something this bad. Um, the, the fact that Sheffield United, no disrespect to them, are camping you in your half for 30 minutes as Manchester United, that's not really acceptable. Now, again, we can talk about what well, Ten Hag's got, Lissandra Martinez and Luke Shaw out injured. But this is a good enough team to, again, no disrespect to Sheffield United, this is a good enough team to beat Sheffield. L look at it, realistically. But for, for the first 30 minutes, it was camped like this. And United couldn't get a foot on the ball. Every time they got the ball, they were pumping it long, going into channels. And it just really didn't work. And I was really concerned with uh, Eric Ten Hag based on his first half. Because, again, I think the solutions were there. You sign Mason Mount, who is who was signed to be a second-phase player. So why not si uh, play him alongside Sofian Amrabat, where Bruno was? Because Bruno can do a job here, but he's not great. Mount was signed for this position and then push Bruno Fernandes further forward. I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. Fortunately, we did see a change to approach in the second half. So before we continue into the video, a quick shout out to today's video sponsor, jerseyfifa.com, the home of all of the greatest football kits. Whether that be the new latest releases or the old classic ones like this, Jersey FIFA has something for everyone, and now you can check it out yourself using the link in the description down below. And also make sure to use code JERSEYFIFA for 10% off when you order. Now at the start of the second half, most of the problems were still there. The fullbacks are still playing on the wrong side and the centre-backs are also playing on the wrong side. Bruno Fernandes is too deep, Scott McTominay is doing nothing. But around the 60th minute we saw Christian Eriksen come on and this does change the game. He comes on for Scott McTominay, Bruno Fernandes pushes higher, Eriksen gets on the ball in these positions. And suddenly United did look a lot better to be fair. I thought United were much improved when they were looking to play in this way. We, uh, we now saw a slower approach in possession, which was important. Rather than pumping the ball forward constantly, it was more measured. It was more controlled, a bit more control on the ball, control of tempo, forcing Sheffield United backwards a little bit and actually sustaining some possessions. So Ten Hag deserves credit for getting the change right, although it still wasn't perfect. So United were now often build in more of a 3-1 shape for Christian Eriksen dropping to left centre-back. It does mean we're still going to see Victor Lindelof pushing up into these areas, which is still confusing to me. And then we've got Dallow and Anthony rotating down this side of the pitch, which I quite like that dynamic. I don't mind that too much at all. It still wasn't perfect, because let's be honest, when you attack down the left wing, you've got Marcus Rashford gets the ball here. And the player he's trying to kind of link and create and spark something with is Victor Lindelof. Uh, Lindelof was awful in this game, but I'm not blaming Victor Lindelof because... He was just put in a position where he was never going to do a particularly good job. So again, I don't blame him for the fact that he was quite poor. I don't know what else he was really meant to do. Fortunately, Marcus Rashford's dribbling was actually really good in this game. And I thought his more traditional wing play was really good in this game. The problem that him and Rasmus Hoyland have at the moment is just that final little bit. I think there's something really exciting for in there. We saw a lot of times Rashford was putting the ball into the box. Uh, crossing into the box for Rasmus Hoyland. He uh, played a really unselfish pass to Rasmus Hoyland at one point as well, on the edge of the penalty area. Those two, they just need that bit more time together to just click. Another day, Rasmus Hoyland could score a couple of goals in this game if his movement is just slightly different, the timing of cross is different. So I thought that was quite exciting. Down the other side, Anthony done a good job of kind of carrying the ball forward, retaining the ball, but you lack real creative spark there. And then in the middle of the pitch, you know, Sheffield were really compact and again, United still struggled. The big thing United did have though, the big weapon that United had was Harry Maguire. Might sound weird from an attacking point of view, but his long switches of play out to Rashford on the other side were the big thing which got United going in this game. Harry Maguire getting the ball here, switching it to Marcus Rashford, getting in one versus one, attacking the byline, getting into these areas, then putting the ball across. And today, Rashford did put the ball across. He did put the ball into dangerous areas. Rasmus Hoyland was trying to attack it. Again, it didn't quite come off, but finally United were at least dominating possession, kind of stretching Sheffield from side from side a little bit. What we also saw at times as well as the game went on, which pleased me, was when in these situations, sometimes United then went backwards and then looked to move the ball up to the other side. It was much more a much more patient approach, so that was also much better. But honestly... 
Harry Maguire is the one which really deserves credit. We can see these numbers here from Ethan Talks on Twitter. Again, if you want to check him out, I really highly recommend it. It's a good Twitter page. 104 touches, 76 passes completed, but I'm looking at those 13 accurate long balls, one out of one tackles, five out of seven aerial duels won. In the air, he was an absolute monster. So not only was he really helping United move the ball forward and progress the ball, defensively, I thought he was brilliant. Every time Sheffield try and counter-attack in the second half, Maguire was really aggressive in his approach. So the ball might come out, go long to Archer. Maguire was on that ball, really aggressive, really led the team. And that was something which Ten Hag spoke about after the game. Maguire's aggression and assertiveness in defence was really good. But in terms of this particular game, what was more important was his ball progressing ability. Night and day, so clear of every other player on the pitch in terms of his ball progression. So basically, the further that way you are on the graph, the more you progress the ball with passing, and the higher up the graph you are, the more you progress the ball via carries, carrying the ball forward. Maguire was by far the most progressive player on the pitch for either side. Absolutely brilliant performance from him again, man. The match at the end of the day, I'm uh, really happy to see that. The fans were chanting his name after the game, which, even if you don't like him as a footballer, personally, that's got to be a big thing for him after, you know, the struggles he's had over the past year or so. So hopefully that's a real big boost for him because a confident Harry Maguire can still be a really useful player for United. But in terms of, you know, the actual game, I can't title this video how United beat Sheffield United because with two moments of individual brilliance, really, Scott McTominay does brilliantly to control the ball down, uh, get the ball down and score, and then Diogo Dallo, it's an incredible finish. But this was individual brilliance we saw in this game. We're a tactical channel, and the tactics weren't very good from Manchester United. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. Have I been a little bit harsh? At the end of the day, United won. Three points was absolutely crucial. So maybe I, I have been a little bit harsh there. I'm not too sure. But in my opinion, it just wasn't really good enough. Let me know what you think, though, in the comments down below. Also, why don't you think Mason Mount was introduced till like the final three minutes? What's going on there? Again, let me know what you think. But apart from that, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.